I was a participant um, a few weeks ago on a panel um, dealing with Germany, Russia, Ukraine at the Monk Center. Um, it was part of a one-day conference on Germany and energy. Um, it was at the end of the day, so it was a rather peculiar setting. It was, wasn't behind the table of speakers. Um, it was um, on a sofa, so kind of an informal setting. Uh, we, we had the traditional Russophile, Professor Johnson, who was a professor of Russian history, um, retired now at the University of Toronto. Um, and it's often difficult to counter some of the, um, some of the well, some of the misinformation that, that was said by him, such as, for example, um, that human rights reports in the West have equally given blame to the Ukrainian side and the separatists, which is simply not true. Um, but the main focus was really looking at um, how Ukraine-Russia fits into the German question. And this is a fascinating topic for a number of reasons. Well, because until the um, annexation of the Crimea a year ago, Germany, its political and business elites, was probably, maybe second to Greece, uh, the most Russophile in Europe. Rather peculiar, for a number of reasons. Of the four Axis powers from World War II, Germany, Austria, Japan and Italy, one can only credit Germany, really, with coming to terms with what it did in World War II. My father, for example, was a slave laborer in Germany in the war and receives a pension since the 1970s from the German government. The so Germans have owned up and have been very critical of of what they did in World War II, which is not the case for the Japanese and Austrians in particular. They've also um, built a successful democracy since World War II, and a successful market economy. At the same time, as we all know, with national identity, it's never totally erased. I mean, um, Toronto is a multicultural city today, but it still has, it's, it's still there, it's still See, it's still available in Toronto that has its origins in a very Protestant um, English or, or British um, background. And this was the city with the biggest orange parades um, outside Northern Ireland until the 1970s. So countries never completely erase their old national identity. It changes, it gets built upon, but nevertheless it's, there's elements of it there. And one element of this that's there in the German case is its inability to see the nations lying between it and Russia. Now, there's been a breakthrough in the case of Poland, of course. It took a long time. Um, the Polish-German border wasn't recognized until 1970. Um, but, uh, and there has been, of course, progress since the collapse of the communism and the unification of Germany in the relationship between Poland and Germany. But traditionally, Germany and Russia had an alliance over the heads of the countries in between. And uh, in, that, in that sense, that it kind of explains why the, the, the business and political elites of Germany were so Russophile and so ignorant of Ukraine. I mean, in the political science and international relations field, for example, I know hardly nobody from Germany and in the academic world who, who follows contemporary Ukraine. Many people follow contemporary Russia, but not contemporary Ukraine. So Ukraine was the missing puzzle. It was the country over, overlooked. And um, it's surprising for many reasons, um, because one argument made by some experts as to why this is the case is because Germany has this great guilt complex vis-a-vis -vis, uh, Russia because of what happened in World War II. The, the worst atrocities, crimes, um, Jewish Holocaust was undertaken, of course, in the East, not in the West. But that's rather a mythical reason. I mean, after all, the Nazis occupied only a very small percentage, less than 10% of Russian territory. And Russians didn't suffer the most. They occupied the most um, in that region, Poland, Belarus, and Ukraine. And the big killing grounds, if we look at Timothy Snyder's book, Bloodlands, the big killing grounds were those three countries. Belarus lost half of its population in World War II. 
Ukraine came a close second, and Poland, of course, was, was also a major uh, center of, of criminality by, by the Nazis. So if, if the Germans should be sympathetic towards what they did to the crimes that they committed in World War II, their sympathy should go out to the Belarusians, Ukrainians, and, and Poles, not to the Russians. And that's even more true because of what's happening in Russia today. Um, in Russia today, 50% of the population thinks Stalin was justified, according to a poll this month, a Russian poll this month. 50% of Russians think that Stalin was justified in repression because it led to the economic advancement of the USSR. This is the product of Putinist, um, of rehabilitation of Joseph Stalin under Vladimir Putin. Could you imagine if 25 years after the collapse of Nazism in Germany, so we're talking about, say, 1970, if 50% of Germans still believe that Adolf Hitler was right in its repression because it led to the building of autobahns in Germany? Um, well, this is the case in Russia. So why would German elites have sympathy towards these, um, this country that's rehabilitating a criminal who was in bed with Adolf Hitler for three years from 1939 to 1941 and was as, as much of a war criminal as Adolf, Adolf Hitler. Um, the international organization, the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, many years ago condemned um, communism and Nazism as equal um, in their crimes. And the Ukrainian parliament just yesterday adopted a law which condemned both as equally um, uh, criminal. Germans should be actually sympathetic towards the Ukrainians, not towards the Russians. Because in Ukraine, since the 1980s, since the late 1980s, so now we're talking about nearly 30 years, because it all began about 1987, 88, when Ukrainian writers began talking about the blank spots in Ukraine history, about Stalinism, about the repression, about the Rostrilinya Vidrojnya, the executed generation and revival. Um, that Ukraine has been on a course of de-Stalinization, again, as reflected in the laws adopted yesterday, um, which talk about decommunization and de-Sovietization. Um, Stalin is regarded as a criminal by the majority of Ukrainians. Two-thirds of Ukrainians believe the Holodomor was a genocide. This, these views of Joseph Stalin and of the Holodomor have actually spread beyond Western and Central Ukraine into Eastern and Southern Ukraine. Um, and they, began, they continued to grow even under Viktor Yanukovych, who was not in favor of those views. So the Ukrainian government should be the one that's recognized as opposing and, 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 and seeking to destroy totalitarian ideologies. And that should generate sympathy in Germany. But that wasn't the case. So, but what happened with developments in, um, in the Crimea and Eastern Ukraine, um, over the last year, has forced the Germans to change. And today, Angela Merkel is one of the strongest supporters of sanctions against Russia. Now, whether those sanctions are tough enough is a separate question. I don't think they are. They're not Iranian-style sanctions, for example. At the same time, she's now in a different group to the traditional Russophiles, such as the Hungarians, um, the Greeks, Italians to some degree, and in the French, who have, of course, this made a lot of money from the building of Russian warships, which are now stranded in France. So Germany has now moved out of that camp. It's not in the camp yet of supporting the American viewpoint of sending military assistance um, to, to the Ukrainian forces. But nevertheless, Germany is now a vocal critic. Why is that? Because Germany um, was a country after World War II that because it um, tried to deal so, so deeply with the crimes that it committed during World War II and under the Nazis, it was a country that was kind of anti-nationalist, anti-nation state. And therefore, organizations like the European Union and NATO, where it could, as it were, bury its nation state, and reduce its sovereignty within those organizations was something that the Germans looked to as positive. 
So the, the, the post-World War II, and in particular post-1990, 1991, structures of Europe, where you had tight integration and tight um, development of countries such as Germany and France within these international organizations, was something that was seen as positive in Germany because it, it um, reduced the threat of a revival of German nationalism. That's a good way of putting it. So in other words, the German position of, tr of giving up sovereignty within the European Union and NATO was the arch opposite of, say, countries like Britain, which has always been very defensive of its sovereignty and has not wanted to have tight integration in the European Union or NATO. Um, with that position that Germany held, that these institutions created in Europe since World War, since World War II and since 1991, Council of Europe, Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, NATO, EU, uh, and, um, and others, Putin came along and, try as, and his goal isn't just to bring Ukraine back into the Russian sphere of influence, it's also to undermine those structures. So in other words, to undermine the very things that the Germans saw as positive since World War II. And hence why Angela Merkel has been very adamant in supporting international law, international rules, and, and, and been very critical of Vladimir Putin's attempts to, to destroy the post-Cold War institutional structures of Europe. Um, and so Germany, as it, as it were, has been forced to rethink. That's not yet, I don't see yet a massive rethink towards a pro-Ukrainian position. Of course, they do support Ukraine's territorial integrity, but 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 they still seem to be searching for the proper response. And Minsk II, in February, was um, really an attempt by Germany, France, and and, the, and President Obama just to get Ukraine to sign up to anything as long as the conflict ended. Um, so Germany has been forced to change its attitudes towards Vladimir Putin and Russia. That's the cost of German business, but um, I don't see how that can now go back to the cozy old days of Russophilia, where the Russians did a great job in buying off European elites. This is one of the strangest aspects of this conflict, is the degree to which Putin has undermined, on the whole, quite successful policies towards European elites. I mean, after all, he bought a German ex-chancellor, Schroeder, to run a Gazprom project from, the, um, from Russia through the Baltic Sea to Germany. Um, when I was at a conference in um, Harvard um, talking about the gas crisis in February 2009, a uh, Harvard professor, very well-known Harvard professor, um, made very derogatory remarks about, about Schroeder, called him the highest paid prostitute in the world. Um, Russia was also very successful in buying off elites in Italy, to some degree in France, Slovakia, Hungary, Greece, and elsewhere. A lot of that's now um, not going to be successful anymore. Russia is trying to maintain its influence amongst extreme right wing and extreme left wing governments such as in Greece and Hungary, but they are not part of the mainstream in Europe. Um, so Russia has lost a lot of its influence here. And in that sense, um, it's time for Ukraine to realize that relations with Germany have changed. They've changed tremendously going back to um, the Yushchenko era, for example, when it wasn't just Yanukovych who was a complainer about Germany German relations towards Ukraine. Um, President Yushchenko also often complained about Germany being an opponent of NATO and EU enlargement. And back in 2009, Volodymyr Horobulin, who was very well known in the, in the national security field in Ukraine, he used to be the secretary of the National Security and Defense Council, um, told the US ambassador that there are two um, Russian embassies in Kiev. One speaks German. That's the degree to which um, there was a kind of a uh, hostility towards Germany. Now, Germany has changed. It's become more critical of Russia. Russophilia has died down. It's not yet in support of sending defensive weaponry. 
which is going to happen sooner or later to Ukraine, because Obama's not only in power until next year. And regardless of who comes to power in the US, Democrat or Republican, it's going to happen. At the same time, Germany hasn't changed. Germany is still an opponent, ironically, of NATO and EU enlargement to Ukraine. So at the same time as Germany is saying, yes, we want Ukraine to be part of the Eastern Partnership, part of this um, association agreement, deep free um, and uh, comprehensive trade agreement with the European Union, it's saying nine to EU and NATO membership. So uh, Russia is complaining about the EU and NATO moving into its sphere of influence, at the same time as Germany is saying, you can only go so far, but not the full hog of membership. It's what um, various experts call EU enlargement light, i.e. enlargement without the membership. So it's time for Germany also to change on questions of NATO and EU membership. So there's a, there's a, there are changes in Europe taking place, and there are changes for the better for Ukraine. There's still a pro-Russian club, but it's less than it used to be. Uh, we can thank Vladimir Putin for that. And sanctions are unlikely to be taken off the, off the table for the medium term, never mind maybe even long term, because I don't see Vladimir Putin, as long as he's alive, withdrawing from the Crimea and giving the Crimea back to Ukraine. And as long as the Crimea is occupied, then EU cannot lift sanctions against, against Russia. So really, the, the questions are to what degree sanctions will move to tier three, i.e. similar to those in place against Iran, which crippled Iran's economic and financial structures. Um, will it move to that? Um, and will it move to the supply of defensive military equipment and trainers to Ukraine? And I think both of those will happen, so Germany will have to readjust. And they'll happen because neither the separatists who seek to control the entire Donbass, or Vladimir Putin, who seeks the federalization of Ukraine with the Donbass having an, or a veto over Ukrainian domestic and foreign policy, and a end to Ukraine's desire to join NATO and the EU, and a more deeper fundamental view that Ukraine is not a separate people, and therefore they should be part of Russia. Neither of those, the separatists or Putin, have achieved their ultimate objectives, um, which is to install a kind of Chechen-style Kadyrov guy in Kiev who would be their puppet, and therefore the conflict's going to continue sooner or later. It's all a question of when the weather improves and it's no longer a muddy bog in eastern and southern Ukraine. And so, therefore, Germany again will have to change in its policies towards Ukraine. Um, but conflict is sadly likely to be inevitable, um, as long as you have uh, war criminals running the separatist organizations, and you have um, an international mafioso thug in power in Moscow.